folks, it's Andy. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Um, welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Uh, okay, I've got loads of great questions to get to today. We've got plenty, uh, so it might be a bit of a, a long episode. So uh, if you want to pause the video and go make yourself a cup of tea or coffee, it might be a good idea. But um, before we get stuck into these questions, of course, I'm going to tell you to go and buy a t-shirt from the Teespring store uh, from the link below um, and go and shop at Kendo Star because that's what supports the channel, my website. It's awesome. Uh, we know all that, but there's something really important I have to tell you about today. I've been saying it for weeks now at the end of these videos. Do not skip this part because it is very important. You need to go down, down underneath this video click subscribe, it doesn't matter, it's just YouTube. And then there's a bell, that is the Kendo bell. You have to ring the Kendo bell. It helps you improve at Kendo. Now, this is a scientific fact. I've got a graph on the wall behind me and we're gonna look at it right now to explain exactly why it's important you click the Kendo bell. You have to ring the bell, not just click it, you've gotta ring it, okay? Ring that bell. Let's get it up and have a look at the graph so we can all be on the same page because I do not want anybody anybody to miss out here. Okay, so here you can see this is an official scientific graph, but be, 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 be just be uh, clear on this. This isn't a prediction, uh, but as you can see, the blue here represents your normal progression at Kendall along the bottom axes there, okay? The blue bars like that. Now you are steadily progressing, which is great. Um, and obviously this represents zero done and this represents eighth dan. Potentially you could go higher than this, but <clears throat> I don't want to uh, exaggerate things. Um, so if you were to ring the bell here, all right, if you were to ring the bell here, now this is last week, if you'd rung it last week, after ringing the bell, you could have seen exponential improvement in your kendo ability, okay? It, it could double every week, all right? And if that happened, look how, look how quickly you could get to eighth dan, okay? So go and do it, subscribe, then click the Kendo bell. You'll get better at Kendo, scientifically proven. Okay, not a prediction. Okay, let's get into the questions. Okay, first one. Hi Andy, I've got a silly question about tenegris. Why are they used with the men? Is there a practical reason for this or is it a tra tradition? Uh, if it's a tradition, can you tell us a little bit about it? So uh, tenegri are traditionally just like um, Japanese towels. Um, that they're not just used in Kendo, they're used in all sorts of uh, Japanese society. Uh, people use them as uh, like tea cloth, tea towels, like, you know, like for drying the pots. They use them for handkerchiefs. There's all sorts of things you can use them for. Um, and we use them in kendos to stop the sweat running from your head into your eyes. Uh, and they do a really good job of that, actually. Um, so that's why we use them. It's not, it, it is tradition, um, but it's also practical. Okay, so we do, we um, use tenegui <clears throat> under the men. Uh, to, to stop the sweat pouring into our eyes, okay? Uh, next one, I have a question regarding visiting dojos. Before I visited a kumdo kum slash kendo dojo uh, in Seoul, where I messaged the captain, uh, university dojo, and visited for free. However, there are cases where you'll need to pay to visit a dojo if you're traveling, uh, sorry, are there cases where you will need to pay if you're traveling around with your burger to another country? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, universities, um, like in even in Japan too, uh, they're often free because they don't have to pay for the use of the facilities, like the halls and stuff. Um, but a private club where they have to pay to rent the hall, then yeah, it's it's normal that you would pay uh, to join the practice. Uh, that's the same in most companies, uh, companies, countries. Uh, <laughs> um, in most countries um, that I've been to, certainly, and in Japan too. Like if you even if you go to an open practice, there's usually a practice fee. Okay. Uh, next one, this one came to me by email, so it's a bit of a long one. It says, when I ordered my Kendo Star Borgo, thank you very much, uh, I remember you mentioning something uh, like we both use the same men's size, but you prefer to go down a size to allow for stretching and softening of the, uh, as the men becomes older. Over the past four, six weeks, I've noticed that my men slowly starts to loosen up during practice and it feels like I'm supporting it with my chin. During last night's practice, my jaw became uncomfortable and started to ache because of this. To the extent that I had to stop, take off my men, flex my jaw a little and put my men back on. I've been wearing a Kendo Star plastic men, uh, sorry, plastic mouth guard um, for pretty much the same time too. And as I wear glasses, this means I'm constantly blowing air upwards towards my glasses to stop them from steaming up because of the confined space created by the mouth guard. So I'm wondering if this has introduced a problem. Uh, my Kendo Star men is pretty much bang on one year old now, so could 
uh, could this just be relations uh, related to it finally being fully broken in? I spoke to my teacher and other experienced club members yesterday, and they both thought I'm simply not tying the men tight enough. Uh, the thing is that this is only something recent, and I'm not just had this trouble before. I've not had the trouble before. Tried using a men pad, but it takes up too much space. Uh, and prevents my face touching the top of the Uchiwa, so you definitely don't need a Mempad. Uh, without a Mempad, if I push the Uchiwa against my face, it feels like it fits perfectly. Uh, I wouldn't want to go down a size at all, but when tying the men, I can feel it releases itself from my face a little. Uh, one of the club members uh, I spoke to uses the Kanto style uh, to, uh, I think you mean the Kansai style, uh, is what everyone seems to call it. We talked about this last week. Anyway, the one from attaching from the top. Uh, <clears throat> and recommend I try that too. If I go down that route, can I order the special Tichikawa and 8 Shakuhimo from Kendall Star? Of course you can. Um, thanks in advance uh, for any advice. Huge thanks for the videos too, as someone who's learning Kendo in a foreign language now that I can no longer live in the UK. These videos are invaluable to me. That's great to hear. Good. Um, that's that's brilliant. So it sounds to me like, uh, yeah, obviously as you use the men, the Uchua stretches a little bit, which is one reason why when I have a new men, I like for it to be a little bit too tight. Now, I don't recommend everybody do that. Um, it's just because it's something that I'm quite used to now because I go through I, I go through wearing a lot of burger sets uh, and I wear them very frequently. So I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't recommend everybody go down that route, but uh, generally it does uh, it does stretch a little bit with use. Sounds like that's what's happened, um, <clears throat> but like you say, it's not to the point where it's too small for you. If you can't you can't get a men pad in, so that's not the answer. It's definitely not too big for you. Um, sounds to me like your teachers are probably right in that it's something to do with the way you're tying the men, uh, and that's probably combined with the fact that it has actually stretched a little bit over time. Probably what's happening is as you're putting it on, as you're tying it, it's somehow getting that little bit of slack whilst you're tying it up. All right. So I think just see if you can tie it a bit tighter. Just try and tie it as tight as you can almost, actually, uh, to be honest. I'm not sure changing to the kan uh, Kansai style or the fixing from the top style um, Himo will make a massive difference, but it might well do. If you really want to go down that route, uh, yeah, just send us an email, mail at kendostar.com. Uh, we'll definitely hit you up with the, the Chichikawa and the Himo. That's no problem at all. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to say that's going to fix the problem because it, it might well not. It might just be a case of you just need to make sure that your face is properly sat on the Uchiwa the whole time you're tying the men. And obviously with this, uh, the, uh, the mask, the face mask thing there, that could be something it's a new thing that's inside the men that's obviously you're not used to doing uh, that could have sort of thrown off your concentration a bit while you're doing it as well so take that into consideration too all right um i, I really think that's that's what it is i don't think it's going to be a case of padding it out it, it sounds like it fits okay so yeah <laughs> next one uh hi andy can kendo car tra time travel whilst dreaming uh do we have any super powers besides learning not to hurt each other uh, another one, is there such a thing as double kode, like really protective ones for the fingers? Oh, and is there a difference between the circle rounded shaped men and the oval ones? Uh, there's some men that are more circular than others. Uh, see you in the future videos. Thank you uh, for the show, Andy. I'm loving it. Greetings from Serbia. Brilliant. Uh, so yeah, uh, I've got some great answers for that coming up right after this. Okay, and we're back. So yeah, shop at Kendo Star. Um, right. <laughs> um, so uh, first one, can Kendo car time travel while dreaming? Um, I'll tell you. Yesterday, uh, did we have a? Do we have any superpowers behind? Be, besides learning not to hurt each other, um, do we have any superpowers besides learning not to hurt each other? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Not yet. Um, again, I'll tell you yesterday. Uh, another one, is there such a thing as double kote, uh, really protective ones for the fingers? Uh, yeah, they're called Vanguard Myrmidon. Um, and is there a difference between the circular shaped men and the oval ones? Some seem more circular than others. Yes, uh, there's no difference between them at all. Uh, the reason some look slightly more circular and others look slightly more ovular um, is uh, because there's two, there's only two main producers of mengane uh 
in Japan. Um, one produces mengane that are slightly more uh, circular shape and another that's slightly more oval shape. The oval shape is much more popular. Um, they're a bigger company. They're the company that produced the IBB series. Um, so that tends to be the most common uh, shape of mengane uh, these days um, is the sort of more uh, oval one <coughs> rather than the uh, the rounder one. Uh, there's no difference in performance for either of them um, at all. Uh, it's It's... Just the, the, the shape of how the manufacturers make the men on it. Uh, next one. I just started Kendo and I need to start acquiring gear. Good. Uh, what is the best shinai to get when starting out? And I think you made another video about how do you... How do I know what measurements I need for the Kendogi and Hakama? Okay, so I posted a link to a Shinai um, that was on offer, but I think that offer's finished now because we crossed over into a new sale. Um, the current one that's on sale, any of the following would be great choices, all right? Goriki. Let's get them up on the screen right now. Okay, so first one uh, is this one, Goriki. Goriki is super popular as a standard basic practice set um, of Shinai. Um, you get three in the pack. Um, I'm not sure if we have this one individually. Um, we do have some individual ones, but you definitely get a better deal if you buy them as a set of three, especially as you, you will go through them as you use them. Um, we basically, yeah, this is this is our sort of standard entry level uh, Shinai. Um, it's great, uh, great uh, set of Shinai, uh, really good all round uh, standard one, decent price. Um, we, we have offers on them from every now and again. We've generally always got some kind of offer on for entry level Shinai. We just finished the one on the Goriki, so these are a bit more expensive right now as we're looking at this um, than they were probably last week because the offer that we've got is finished. Um, but we've got a different offer on, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, another option um, is uh, this one. Uh, this is the uh, original uh, Kendo Star model all-purpose Shinai. Um, these are our best-selling Shinai actually at the minute. Um, we've Again, we've usually got offers on these. They're not on offer right now because we've got a different offer running, which I'll tell you about in a sec. But uh, these are basically a step up from the Gordy Key. It's slightly better bamboo. It's a nicer quality bamboo. Um, and it's slightly nicer overall balance. These are what I use for the most part of my Kendo training, um, to be honest. Um, so these are also a great set. Uh, and then finally, we have these. These are the Kensei. Uh, and these are the ones that we've got on offer right now. This is a really good deal, actually, for three of them. As you can see, they're actually cheaper than the other two uh, that... I just showed, but it depends when you're watching this video. If you're watching this in the future, this offer may be finished and we'll have an offer on one of the others, all right? So always check those three um, if you're looking for uh, entry-level Shinai and see which is the best deal going at the minute. You'll be happy with which whichever one. It just depends on what our stock is sort of levels are like and our sort of deals we can get with our suppliers as to what we can offer on a monthly basis in terms of our... Um, our special offers, all right? So uh, the Kensei, it's a lot like the Goriki, just again, it's a step up on the uh, the bamboo and you actually get a really nice uh, set of fittings on these. These come with double layer, uh, double folded uh, fittings. Um, they're really nice um, shin actually, these Kensei. I'm, I'm really quite uh, pleased with them. Um, so I'm gonna start rotating some of these in with my practice as well, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, any of those three, uh, you'll be more than happy with, I'm absolutely sure. In terms of the second part of your question, um, I do want to make a more updated video about measuring for the Hakama and Kendogi, but basically um, the best thing to do is look at the size charts on our website um, and essentially uh, you want to think about your height and your waist. They're the two main things that we need to consider. Um, if your height is around average height uh, for a male, um, which is like around 170 to 175, um, usually you want like a size 3, 3.5 or 4 for the Kendogi and like a size 25 or 26, possibly 27 for the Hakama. If you're taller than that, you'll need a bigger size. If you're shorter than that, you'll need a, a smaller size, obviously. Uh, and if you're uh, a female, uh, then usually um, average height for the is generally around like between 160 and 170, usually size two or three for the Kendogi, sometimes a one if you're very slim build. Um, and uh, the Hakama, usually ladies wear a Hakama a little bit higher, so you'll need a slightly longer Hakama than an equivalent um, height male. Um, so you'd, yeah, you're probably looking like a 25, uh, sorry, 24, 25 or 26, depending on your height again. 
if you're in doubt, just send us an email. Just say, look, I, I'm looking at this uniform because it depends on the uniform as well. Some of our uniforms run at a slightly different size. So send us an email, uh, mail at kendostar.com. I'm looking at this uniform. Uh, I'm this tall. My waist is about this. Um, and anything about, you know, I'm average build, I'm large build, I'm slim build, whatever. Um, and we'll let you know exactly what the best size to choose is. Uh, next one, I'm still learning in Jigeko, but uh, my opponent and sparring partner uh, was attacking me in a very fast-paced manner. I was able to deflect most of it and use Haraiwaza on most occasions, but I felt that it wasn't really good kendo because we didn't give enough space close to Tsubizari Ai, but not Tsubizari Ai, kind of like 30 to 45 centimeters apart from each other, with the Shinai held next to the head as we both kept attacking and deflecting. Um... There wasn't proper semi, and I think, uh, given that we were literally going at each other at such a short distance, I had to break out and move back a few steps to regain pro proper posture. Plus, kikentaiichi is hard to achieve in such a situation. Is this good kendo? I think you've answered your own question there. Uh, am I missing an important lesson here with the fast attacks? I've included the advice that a senior gave me. I look forward to hearing from your perspective, Andy. Uh, my senior, Haya Dan, said at the end of training that I can't assume that my opponent will give me breathing space and that they... Uh, and if they start uh, attacking constantly, I'll lose my mind and concentration. Yeah, um, sounds to me like you're putting a little bit too much emphasis on making strikes and being struck. Um, it doesn't matter if you get hit in Jigeko, and it doesn't matter how many times you make hits. You have to try and practice your best correct kendo. Um, now, of course, you want to make successful strikes because that's part of the, I not the idea of it, but like, you are competing to make successful strikes with your opponents, but not at all costs. If you stood at this sort of, what I'd call the sort of Chukan or the Chu Tohampa, this kind of in between Tsubazeriai and even between Chikama, and you're just bashing at each other, you're kind of just stick fighting and you're not doing Kendo anymore. And of course, like you say, you can't do the Kikentai no Ichi. So you try to remove yourself from that. Try to uh, make strikes that have a, a definitive start middle which is the actual striking part um and finish is anshin okay um where you actually make distance that's the start try to find the opportunity if you can't it doesn't matter especially if you're just learning when jigeko don't worry about trying to do really strong semi or something like that just get to the good distance what you think is a good distance you can make a good attack from and make a strike with fumikomi um and kikentai no ichi uh with stem you give everything to it don't worry if it was successful or not um, and try to practice the correct striking um, more than anything, all right? Uh, and I think it's from the same person. Uh, another question, any tips on how to execute proper Dabanoaza? I'm get, I keep feeling as if mine is slow and my Shinai gets deflected before I even strike men. Yeah, uh, pass fourth down uh, and then you'll start to understand Dabanoaza. Uh, you don't need to worry about Dabanoaza until you're at least fourth down. Right. Uh, when you get to fourth dan, it will start to become a little bit more self-apparent. Uh, and if it hasn't, then ask me again. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Andy. Has Kendall Borga always comprised of men, Tare, Do, and Kote? Uh, in pre-wars years, did it depend on the dojo or you that were using it? For example, Naginata of the uh, Sune um, to protect that area. Um, not to be, not, not to nitpick here, but it's, it's, you don't need a T, it's not Tsune, it's Tsune. Uh, that's, a, that's just the Japanese, uh, speaker in me coming out, uh, <laughs> to protect that area. Um, uh, so was there more or less parts of the Borgo used dependent on the style, uh, and the targets that they used before Kendall was formalized to use the targets we have today? Thanks. Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. I'm pretty sure that, um when Kendall Borger, obviously I'm sure they developed different parts of it separately, um, but when Kendall Borger as a thing started to come about, um, generally it has always been, to my knowledge, uh, sort of men, kote, do, and tare. And I've got this book here. This is one of my favorite books. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's a book about um, a, a famous craftsman in Japan. Um, I don't, I don't know if, I don't think it's very easy to get a hold of, so I'm not going to go into the title of it too much. But um, it's one of the books uh, that talks a lot about Kendall Borger, and there's got some history of it as well. Um, and uh, this is this is a this is a photo of a, a Borger 
from it. I don't want to get in trouble for copyright. But that borgo there clearly has a man called Edo and Tare. Uh, and that is from Taisho Sanden. So Taisho 3. That's 1914. Okay, so at least from 1914. Uh, and another interesting thing here is it says, uh, in these days, um, the most expensive burger was 30 yen. Okay, 30 yen. Uh, but this one was sold for 100 yen. <laughs> so it's a super expensive one. Um, and then another page from this um, shows a picture of um, Takano Saburo Sensei, uh, who is obviously one of the key people in the development of modern kendo. Um, look at kenshi247.net for more info about that sort of thing. But there's a picture of him there, and I think this picture is on kenshi247 as well. But you can see that he's clearly wearing the men kote uh, do and tare. Um, very similar to the kind of ball. You could, you could, he, you know, he could engage in the modern kendo practice. Uh, seamlessly uh, with that equipment, right? So, um, to my knowledge, um, this is this is the uh, you know it, it, that's the way it's been. Okay, so yeah, this is a really good book. Um, it was by Kendo Nippon, I think, put this book out. Uh, I know someone's going to ask me, so it says it's it's called uh, 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 Suzuki Suzuki Kenshin Gatsukuru Honmono no Kendo Gu. Yeah, Suzuki Kenshin got good at Honmon no Kendoga. It's a really good, really interesting book. Uh, and it's, uh, it, 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 if you can read Japanese, it's all in Japanese, of course. Um, but if you can read Japanese, uh, I learned a lot about Kendo Borgu um, and how it's made. Uh, whilst I was living in Japan, uh, still learning the ropes of the industry from this book. So I don't know where you can get it, though, anymore. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, what should the goals of a senior in class... Uh, what should be, the, I guess, what should be the goals of a senior in class and how important are they to school? Uh, this is really simple. A uh, senior in class should be a good example to the juniors. Um, they should be a good example in every regard, okay? Uh, in every regard. Um, and they're extremely important to the, to the school, to the dojo. Uh, and that's it. It's as simple as that. Uh, next one, what are the rules around scoring kote if your opponent's right hand is not holding the shinai? If they are performing katate waza, or if they simply let go of their shinai for some other reason? Does the left kote automatically become a valid target even if it's not above the chest? Or is the right kote still the proper target even when it's not holding the shinai? Uh, no, it's a valid target. The the rules say that you can hit uh, the left kote if they're not in chewed on. It doesn't say anything about the, where, where it is in relation to the height of the chest. Um... You're gonna struggle doing it. It's not easy, uh, to be honest. But if they, you know, if they take take a hand off and put it behind their back, for example, then yeah, you can whack them on the left cut there. See if if you could do it well with Kikentai Noichi, yeah, sure, it's Ippon, I guess. Um, I think you'll struggle to do it whilst they're in the middle of doing some kind of katate waza. But uh, theoretically, yes, in practice, I don't think you're gonna see it work very often. Next one. Hi Andy, any tips on dealing with foot blisters? Only training once a week doesn't seem to be giving my feet any th time to toughen up. Yeah, uh, I know it's tough when you're only practicing once a week, but um, I, I only practice once a week for like the first year of my kendo. Um, and it, it, they do toughen up. They do toughen up. Uh, <clears throat> and there's two things. Uh, tape helps. <laughs> a bit of tape, like a, what's called zinc oxide tape. Um, you can get from like Amazon or you can get from the chemist probably or something. Um, just wrap that around uh, your toe, your big toe. That will help. Uh, you'll get them on the base of your foot, like on the ball of your foot. Um, and it's especially um, if your left foot is pointing out, it's one of the, it's, it, it, it definitely helps to keep that left foot straight and you'll definitely have less problem with blisters. It won't be completely solved, but it'll get better with time. Um, it, it does It does take a while, though. Uh, next one. Hi, Andy. First of all, I'm a fan of the show and Kendo Star. Good job. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm quite new at Kendo, and I'm going to get my sixth Q grade soon. I read that you can achieve Shodan in two years uh, if you work hard. Is that correct? Also, I read that it's possible to progress fast if you can, uh, you can skip the Q grades. Is that true? Keep it up. I'm loving it. Uh, so it depends on your country and the rules in your federation. All right. Um, in my country, in the UK, where I started Kendall, um, I think you can uh, you can do EQ, the first Q. You can do after, I think, six months of, of Kendall. And you can do... Uh, 
you can do Shodan, I think, three months after that. So technically in nine months. Um, I did it in 10 months, all right? So you can do it from starting Kendo to uh, no, 11 months. Sorry, I think it was for me. Um, yeah, I started in uh, September. It was a September and I got my Shodan in the October, the following October. Um, so it is possible, but it depends on the rules in your country, okay? I, I, in my first ever grading, which is a Q grading, we, you could skip the grades and I skipped straight to second Q because I did progress quite quickly because uh, I was just maniac about Kendo, just all I cared about every single day of the week. Um, nearly got fired uh, <laughs> a couple of times. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, in other places, in other countries, they have a strict system where you have to raise through each Q rank um unfortunately in japan you don't in japan uh you don't have to do that in, in japan you can just go straight to do it even if you start as an adult same as same as here and I, I think that's the best way personally but uh that depends like i say um on the on the country and the federation that you're in but is it possible yes you can definitely you can get to the level of shodan uh in less than two years uh i got to second dan in two years so yeah uh <clears throat> Hi Andy, do you know or can you recommend a book on Kendall? Not a training manual, but maybe history, biography, autobiography, obviously in English. Yes, I certainly can. Um, so um, I've, I was just uh, poking around my bookshelf earlier to find some examples for you for this. Uh, the first one I'd recommend is this one, Kendall for All Levels uh, by uh, Sotaro Honda. Uh, Honda Sensei was uh, my first coach of the British team. He lived in the UK for uh, like 10 years, did his PhD here. It's all in English. It's a fantastic book. Now, it is, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a training manual. It's not a biography, but it's like how to approach, like the mental approach to Kendall. And I think it's really, really useful. It's really interesting. It tells you like how to, how you should do uh, a, a approach to Kirikaisu Uchikomi or like how to practice with like the mindset of pra practicing um like at different dan ranks or um you know with like people who are perhaps older or ju junior to you and stuff like that um for a male practitioner against a female stuff like that is it's really really interesting uh, i think you can get it on amazon let's have a look so yeah it's on amazon um you can get it there i think it's published by kendall world um so it's fantastic uh speaking of kendall world uh, another fantastic book is this one kendo the culture of the sword uh this is like um of course this is in in english too this is by a very good friend of mine uh dr alexander bennett Bennett Sensei is fantastic, inspirational kendoka. Um, he's been a really good friend of mine for a long time. Someone I really um, value. Um, you sometimes see me twiddling a pen around uh, on screen. Uh, it's, it was a gift from uh, Bennett Sensei, that pen. Uh, so I still hold that dear to me. Um, it's great. It, it goes through history of kendo and stuff, and you know, it's it's a great um, it's a great book. Culture of the sword. Kendall Culture of the Sword, and that's on Amazon too. Of course, that's in English. Another one, if you can get your hands on it, but I I couldn't find this one on Amazon. Um, this was um, a gift to me from Bennett Sensei. Um, and this is, uh, this was a, a really, this was a really well-selling book in Japan. Um, and it's, it's called A Bilingual Guide to the History of Kendall. I think it's quite rare now, so I think you might struggle to get your hands on that one. Um, but basically it's in Japanese and English. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's another good one. But the other two, um, definitely, uh, worth, um, worth picking up. Okay, next one. Uh, I have a 14-year-old Shodan candidate who could be doing her examination at the end of the year. Should she be successful, would, she, would it be appropriate for members who are new to the club to call her senpai, even though they may be older than her? Now, this was in the group and quite a few people commented on this, so I'm just going to read your follow-up comment as, as well to give context to your question. Uh, thanks for the feedback, everyone. Anyone with experience of how this happens in Japan where the senpai kohai relationship extends beyond the dojo? I'm all for individual interpretations how this works at your dojos but i'd also be interested in how it works in a greater context so you've got a 14 year old girl she's going to take shodan and then you've got beginner adults who are older than her joining the dojo should they call her senpai if you have a culture 
of using the word senpai in your dojo and you use it in your dojo in the context of somebody that is more experienced um, than yes uh, and has been doing kendo longer, potentially at a higher grade, um, then yes, it would be perfectly acceptable for them to call her senpai. Um, in terms of, it, it really depends on how you want to run it in your dojo. It's not like odd or something. Um, in Japan, it becomes very grey. becomes very grey. Um, the situation you're talking about is like very rare, very rare that an adult would start kendo later in life um, and then revert. I can't, I can't imagine. I mean, they do. There are adults, you know, there are adults that start kendo, but the vast majority of people that start kendo in Japan are, are, are children. Um, so it's very rare that a beginner adult is junior in terms of rank or experience to like a 14 year old. Um, I can't imagine a situation where a adult, regardless of their kendo experience would ever refer to, um, refer to a 14 year old as senpai. It, it just doesn't seem appropriate. Um, it technically it's true in a kendo context only, but it would just be so odd and weird for that to happen. Um, given the greater cultural surrounding and the kind of uh, context that that will be happening in. I just can't imagine it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just can't imagine it happening. Um, I've never seen it happen. And I have seen adults that start Kendall, but even, you know, when they talk to 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 kids that are higher grades than them, they, they just talk to them like they're kids. They don't talk to them like they're seniors. Um, it doesn't mean that they're always, they're just rude to them or something though. Um, especially if, the, you know, but... Mm, it's a bit bit of a it's a super unusual situation you would find that to be honest um because because also the other reason i'm saying that is because like a 14 year old shodan in japan first off a 14 year old shodan uh yeah 14 year old shodan probably more yeah probably like a 14 year old shodan in japan like they're, they're not going to have the situation where they train with that kind of beginner adult like, unless, even at, like, the local dojo, like, uh, the beginner adult comes, that 14-year-old shodan, it's, like, unless they're a family member, he's going to have nothing to do with this adult. Like, this adult's going to get taught by a sensei who's obviously going to be another adult. So, it's never going to be the case where that 14-year-old is like, right, can you teach, you know, the sensei's not going to tell that 14-year-old to teach the basics or something to that adults so they're not going to be calling them senpai in that context either so it's just it's just such a different situation that, than you have out elsewhere uh next one hi andy i got a question on how do you perform tenuichi while doing katate men and kote uh, same as you do for uh morote men and kote uh with the left hand so squeeze this way yeah so if you were doing katate men you're going to be reasonably relaxed. And then at the last minute, obviously you still got a bit of tension here. Last minute, squeeze here for that last snap. Yeah. Mem. Kote. Okay. I'm no expert in it. Um, cause I don't use those waza ever, but, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, looking forward to the new Anglo Japanese trade deal. So this is in reference to, um, reference, reference to, uh, the recent news that the UK, has signed a trade deal with Japan, which is great, um, I guess. Uh, am I looking forward to it? Not particularly. It, wasn't, it won't make a huge difference to me. Although, um, although this, is, this is something I talked about a few, uh, I think it was last year now, when the, uh, the EU signed a similar agreement with uh, Japan. And I got a question for Kendall Rant, where, which was, um, now that the EU and Japan are signing this trade deal, does that mean if I buy something from Japan, and it's shipped directly to Japan. I won't have to pay import fees. Uh, the fact is, not that's not the case. That isn't what will happen. Um, and it's the same for me as a business. Um, and it's the same. I mean, it, it it's great, but it won't it won't make a huge difference to 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 our business if I'm honest. Um, because the vast majority of import costs. <clears throat> okay, so if we were to ship something here from our uh, place in Japan. <coughs> excuse me or if we were to ship it direct to you 
outside of Japan, it turns up on your door and you have, we have to pay import duty. All right? We have to pay import duty. Um, and what that, well, when I say import duty, it's import costs. Okay? And what this Anglo-Japanese trade deal or the same sort of thing with the EU uh, may do is remove uh, the, uh, the customs duty. All right? The customs duty. But that actually accounts for a very small amount of the import costs. The vast amount, like if, let's say, like we, we literally move like thousands of dollars of stock or pounds or euros, whatever you want to call it, um, of, of stock between uh, Japan and uh, the UK and, and the rest of the world. Uh, and let's say we, we, we have a stock delivering, delivery and just for the sake of simplicity, the import costs are a thousand UK pounds. All right, UK pounds, because that's where we're based. All right, um, of that thousand pound, about eight hundred and fifty of it is VAT. All right, that's VAT for the British government. Right, then there's probably another like uh, fifty. Well, probably like a hundred pound in um, in the customs uh, duty. And then the remaining fifty pound will be like the the handling fees and stuff like that. So that hundred and that uh, hundred pound of custom fees that probably that might disappear, yeah. But it's 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 small talk. It's small stuff, yeah. Uh, as a business, like it's not a major thing because the VAT thing for us will then be that'll go on our VAT return. Um, anyway, so it's not it's not a huge thing, but like as a like for. A, if I was a consumer, uh, if you were to, or if we were to ship to you from Japan, for example, um, or if you were to do something like, like, well, I'm not gonna go crazy and say you would do something as crazy as order from a different company that's based in Japan. You wouldn't do that. Right? That'd just be crazy. Uh, and then watch these videos for free, as if you would do that. Anyway, uh, but if you were to do that, you'd still have to pay the import costs. That's the fact of it. Uh, okay, uh, next. Um, I hope I'm not too late. I met a person who's going to the same university me as last. Uh, sorry, as the, who's going to the same university as me last month, and we were talking about kendo. We wanted to start offering kendo in our university. Of course, we will be in, uh, integrating the kendo show and the other uh, kendo tubers. Uh, would you recommend us starting a beginners course at another dojo whenever they resume uh, before starting our own? Uh, who should take the role of sensei and how can one identify a good sensei? Would it be frowned upon if we took the decision to hire a sensei? Uh, I know in the past you have mentioned Zero to Shodan series and we're looking at it. Uh, we are aware of the cost involved of starting such a, uh, and joining the BKA uh, and what not, but would appreciate your advice on starting. So it depends on what experience you've got, right? But if you haven't got like any experience or if you don't have the f like first done at least, um, I recommend like finding the closest kendo club to you and try and get the support of the uh, the teacher there and see if there's some way you can arrange setting up a, a university club that had potentially, um, you know, you might even be able to set up something that feeds to their club. So there's a benefit on their club as well and that you get the students from the university in. Um, or if you set something up on campus using their facilities and maybe, yeah, like you say, get the sensei to come over and teach. Now, I know there's some universities, they even have programs where they'll give you funding to pay for the costs of, of, of getting in an outside coach. And if that's something you can do, by all means, I don't think there's anything wrong with you using that method uh, to get a decent teacher in to help you do it. I think you're better off doing that than fumbling around in the dark on your own. Uh, to be honest, and as, as good as Zero to Shodan is, uh, it won't be the replacement for having an actual in-person teacher, um, especially if you're setting up like a university club. Uh, for the most part, especially if you've got the, you know, it's not like you're, you know, like it's not like you're in the middle of the desert and there's nothing for anywhere miles around. If, you, if you're nearby to another kendo club, definitely get them on board and get their help. I definitely think that that's the best way to go about it. Uh, and then you can make sure everything's above board. Your students are going to be learning kendo properly and they're going to be able to go through the correct processes when it comes to getting grades and entering tournaments and stuff like that. Uh, next one. Hi, Andy. Whatever, do I, whatever I do, my senpai won't notice me. This makes me very sad. Any advice to make me a happy kohai? Uh, stop worrying about your senpai noticing you. I don't get it. Um, I think that's some sort of joke. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about senpai noticing you. It's 
doesn't matter. You're good enough as you are. Uh, or try harder. Get better at Kendo. Ring the Kendo bell. Shop at Kendo Star. Definitely notice you then. Everyone will notice you. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Andy. What would you say distinguishes an excellent Kendo player from a good one? That's a really good question. Um, and I've been all around the world practicing Kendo. Uh, and I've practiced with some of the best players in the world. And I know personally some of the, the best Kendo players in the world. Um, and... The answer is really simple. It, it's not esoteric. It's not. It's not super philosophical. It's effort. It's effort. The excellent players put in more effort. They put in more effort. Like, if you're not an like, like, I, if, uh, invariably, I've never seen the case where somebody doesn't put in the effort, and then they've become excellent. And I've never seen somebody that puts in the effort that the excellent players are doing and not become excellent. Um, the fact is, is that every, you know, there's like, for example, the, the Japanese national team, there's a limit on how many people can be in it. But there's a lot of excellent players, more than there are spaces on the national team. But um, the different, yeah, the difference between a, a good play, a good kendoka and, the, and, and a truly excellent one the ones that make Hachidan. Um, and, and even some of the ones that don't, uh, you know, of course. I'm not saying that everyone that doesn't achieve Hachidan doesn't put the effort in because there's plenty that do. It's not not even that, but... It's effort. It's 100% effort. You, you, tr you try harder than everyone else. That's what makes you excellent. No doubt about it. Next one. Uh, hello, Andy. I recently engaged in Jigeko with my sensei. When asking for feedback, he said his observation is that I'm afraid to get hit and that I need to just move on and strike, uh, move into a str into strike. Honestly, I don't feel like I'm afraid of getting hit, but my instinct is to block or evade when I see a strike coming. Is it poor form to block in Jigeko? Should I just move in with my own strike, even though it may end up with a rather sloppy collision? Thanks always. Well, look, blocking is being afraid of being hit. Even if you want to call it instinct, fear is an instinct, right? Um, so it, that's fine. It's not. It, it, it's not like a judgment to say that you for for your sensei to say that you were afraid. Um, it happens to everyone. <laughs> um, to to give in to the to the instinct of fear. But yeah, um, no, you. It depends. The, it depends on the type of keiko, but if you're practicing with your sensei, no, you shouldn't be blocking or evading. Uh, you should be trying to make positive attacks with good form, good kikentai no ichi, uh, with full commitment, um, without worrying you if, if you're going to receive a strike. And if you receive the strike, then receive the strike. The sensei can hit you whenever they want. That's why they're the sensei. All right. So don't try to compete with them or try to make more strikes than they do. Um, that's nonsense. It's, it's nonsense. They can beat you. They're the, they, they're the sensei. They have to be able to beat you. Um, they're not trying to beat you either, though. They're trying to raise your ability up. Um, so it's not it's not a competition. It's a chance for you to practice what you've learned whilst you're put under the, the pressure of the fact that sensei is also going to hit you at the same time. Um, so it's a chance for you to try and, try and throw that away. Okay? So... Mm. Your sensei's right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> last one. Why don't we have everyday clothes made of Orizash fabric? Do you want or everyday clothes made of Orizash fabric? Um, Orizash fabric is a kendogi material fabric. Um, the main reasons are that one is good Orizash fabric uh, is usually made from uh, aizome, genuine aizome. So it'd turn you blue. You wouldn't be able to wash it. You'd have to hand wash it. You don't want everyday clothes like that. Like you sit on your sofa and you stain all your sofa blue. You're not going to make many friends with that. Um, compared to like t-shirts, like it's heavier, it's thicker, it's hotter. Um, I, I don't, I just don't think it's suited for it. Like it, it works for the wafuku, which is the Japanese clothes that we wear in kendo. Um, on the basis of kendo, because it's hard wearing, like, you know, um, but, you know, there's, there's a good reason why we don't use it for everyday clothes. 
And it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you for joining me for today. For today. Oh, I've got to stop getting those words mixed up. Don't forget, you've got to click the Kendo bell. Remember the graph. Yeah, it's not a prediction, but it is scientific evidence. So, uh, subscribe, ring the bell. Don't forget, uh, buy a t-shirt, um, shop at Kendo Star. That's what pays for the channel. Channel doesn't exist. You don't get all these free videos that you just watch for free without paying anything, uh, without shopping at Kendo Star. Okay, kendostar.com, it's my website, it's brilliant. All right, thanks for joining me. See you next time, bye-bye.